Okay, so we got the book of Jude. If you want to take in your Bibles, I don't have all of it on the screen, so we're going to read it here in a minute. But the book of Jude, and uh, this is a series of sermons we've done. There are one chapter sermons. Now, there's one other one chapter sermon that I've not tackled this time. Does anybody know what chapter that, what book that would be in the Old Testament? What? Somebody muttered something. Obadiah. Okay, and if you want, you can go back and read Obadiah in the Old Testament. It's one chapter long. It's got a very specific purpose to it. It's pretty interesting. But Jude and Philemon, 2nd and 3rd John, are all powerful books with strong applications. By the way, when we read these books, we should not minimize them because they're short, because they can still be very powerful and kind of hit the spot for sure. For instance, Jude is only 25... Uh, verses long. And we're going to read it right now. I want you to follow along with me on your devices or your Bibles or whatever. It starts out in Jude verse 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation that we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to Contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. That's a key verse right there. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. And they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ as our only sovereign and Lord. So as you're reading this book... You want to come, with, what are the hinge verses? What are the most important verses that speak to the purpose of this book? I think it's right there in the latter part of verse 4. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Though you already know all of this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound for everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Now, we won't talk about this today, about the angels and how they were kept in darkness and all that. But as you read this, you can kind of get a feel for the heaviness of this book. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion, and they serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal life. In this very same way, on the strength of their dreams, those ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. And he, yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things that they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain, they've rushed into profit into Balaam's error, they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These people are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, Shepherds who only feed themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown about by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering their wandering stars for whom the blackest of darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of the ungodly acts that they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires and they boast about them themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But, now let's turn page here, but, dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. 
But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you into eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing that's stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, we've looked at 3 John, 2 John, we've looked at Philemon, and they all have kind of same kind of purposes to it. What you get in Jude is a lot heavier than those three chapters, um, and it's very personal in many ways for the people who were reading them. So when we think about Jude, we have to think about who is Jude, and he lets us know in verse 1, he, Jude is a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Now, if he was the brother of James, what did that make him half-brother to? Jesus, okay? But he does not pull that out in this book. And, I, you know, I just think, when I think about myself, in order to have everybody really buy into what I'm saying, I would be tempted to say I'm a servant of Jesus Christ and his half-brother. And I'm a brother to James because James was a powerhouse in the early church. He really led the Jerusalem church and was one of the main leaders of the church in that day. And so you have this kind of introduction, which is a little bit of a soft sell, if you want to say it that way. And then he says, to those who've been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. You remember that the brothers of Jesus back in, I think it's John chapter 7, they didn't believe who Jesus said he was. They didn't buy into all this stuff about Jesus. But then after the resurrection, what did all the brothers do? They kind of came around because they saw something that were totally unexpected. And so Jude is the writer of this book, and he doesn't claim any kind of power because he's a half-brother of Jesus. Instead, as part, of the over, the resurrection, as part of the resurrection power of the first few chapters of Acts, we see that James was the primary leader of, church, of the church in Jerusalem, and Jude was known as a leader and a teacher as well. And so we kind of see in verse 3 here a little bit, about what he was wanting to do. It says here, dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share. Okay, you want to talk with anybody and you really want to get down into the, into the grassroots of what they believe and what they, what they deal with in their life, talking about the salvation that we commonly share is not a bad thing at all. But he was compelled to write and to urge these people that he's writing to to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people to contend for the faith. Now, 2 John, 3 John especially, talk about false teachers a lot in there. And this is really what Jude is attacking in a more heavy and aggressive way. He's talking about false teachers who were secretly slipping into the church. And this was happening even in the middle part of the first century. You know why? Because it all of the faith that's represented in some of these books toward the end of the New Testament, they're all second-generation faith, which means if people aren't paying attention to what's really right, and if they're not paying attention to what God says in his word, they will allow other people to kind of slip in as that second-generation group, and they kind of spin things out of control. Ends up not being very good at all. The false teachers had an agenda, and that was that Christians did not have to be concerned with holiness and purity. They didn't need to be concerned with holiness and purity because we all fall under the grace of God. And so this is a common thing in the New Testament from some of the teachers. Paul talked about this in chapter 6, verse 1 of Romans, when he said, are we able to say that we can just get all the grace we want, we don't have to be holy? And guess what he says? He says, by no means. The exact wording on that in Romans 6, 1 is this. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace might increase? By no means. But now, toward the end of the first century, or at least toward the end of the middle of the first century, there's a struggle that's going on here. And it seems to be that the struggle is that people are saying, you know what? The more we sin, the more grace we get. And so if you want lots of grace in your life, you just ought to sin more. 
And that was a very, very prevalent attitude in the first century church. And Paul again takes that on. Paul again says this in Titus chapter 2, for the grace of God that brings salvation appeared to all men and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled lives in this present age. That's a really great verse, second, or Titus 2, 11 and 12. Because what the challenge here is from Paul in Titus and from Jude in his book is, is that you can't say, well, if I want more grace, all I need to do is sin more. That's just really kind of backwards. And not right at all. So what Jude says is if you are a disciple of Christ, and I'm going to assume that most of you are disciples of Christ, but probably not all of you. What does it mean to be a disciple? To be a disciple means you are a learner. It means you are somebody who is a student of somebody else. We talk about the Apostle Paul. Before he became a follower of Christ, he was the student of Gamaliel, who was one of the greatest teachers in the Jewish uh, tradition ever, and he was a disciple of them. A lot of times we have people who really almost substitute in the 21st century, almost substitute being a disciple of Jesus with being a disciple of a preacher. Well, I'm so-and-so's, I go to so-and-so's church, and he's, he's who I pat pattern my life after, and you get all this stuff kind of rolling around, and all of a sudden you're building kind of this celebrity basis of leadership in the church. And it's something I think we all have to be very concerned about and need to stand up and say, this book is what is most important. It really doesn't matter who's preaching what it is, okay, at all. And you can, you can insert the names in there, and I do this uh, often just thinking about it, and I think I, I just want to be a disciple of Jesus. And my greatest desire is, is that you never become a disciple of me. Because you don't live with me. And you don't know some of the things I think and some of the things I do and some of the things I struggle with at all. And if you think, well, he's got all his act together, you're, you're in trouble with that because I don't have my act together. And neither do all the other celebrity preachers in our country and across the world. And if they won't say it, somebody should say it for them. Instead, you're going to contend earnestly not for the celebrity that brings the word. You're going to contend earnestly for the faith the faith of God, and that that is what really we have, to bound, we have to bind our lives to, for sure. So these false teachers were worming their way into the church, saying that because of grace, Christians can do whatever they want. Now, I don't want you to take this wrong, and I almost hesitate to say it, but I think I have to. Things are not much different 2,000 years later. They really aren't. Even much of the church, not all of the church, but much of the church finds themselves in this tension between morality and immorality, between what God wants us to do and what the world says that it's okay to do. And where it gets even more complicated is when we say, well, I'm only going to do what my church says I'm going to do because I'll get more grace. And that is so backwards thinking. And it's certainly not something that God wants us to attach ourselves to. I think this kind of thinking has infected the church today, especially when it comes to holiness and purity. We live inside a culture now, and I want you to hear these words clearly. We live inside a church culture where purity and holiness, especially in relationships, has been cast aside. And what we say privately, maybe not out loud to anybody, I will do what I want and conform my life to what culture says is okay rather than what the scripture says. And the problem is, is if you're doing that, you're buying into a whole method of false teaching that's going to drag you down. So Jude warns us. He says, I urge you to contend earnestly for the faith that once was entrusted to all the saints. Contend earnestly. What does that mean? To contend earnestly. It means fight. Fight for the faith. Fight for the truth of the scripture fight for the truth of what the Bible says that we should do, especially in terms of morality and immorality. We are going to fight for that, and we're going to fight by contending earnestly for the faith. Paul uses that very same language in 
2 Timothy chapter 4, I have fought the good fight. Now, you guys got to stay with me here. I'll start over. You know, I have fought the good fight. He was saying literally, I am contending earnestly for the faith that has been entrusted to me. And Jude is saying, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you're called to fight for the truth. That's what you are called to do. And this may be one of those defining moments for you because we can't just be somebody that hangs around Christianity and faith without it making a real significant difference in our own life. Instead, because of the heartbeat of what Jude is saying here is we are challenged to contend earnestly. That means that we don't run at the first difficulty, that we don't choose different sides when it gets harder or anything like that. Instead, we are, cont- cont- we are contending earnestly for the faith, for the faith. Now, I could go a hundred directions here, and, uh, but I want to touch just for a moment on an issue that's really prevalent today in our culture and has become even prevalent in the church. I want us to take a broad view for a minute about where the church is when it comes to culture. Where is the church? There's no doubt that we find ourselves in a major shift in our culture right now in the 21st century. Acceptance of immorality is one thing that is dramatically altering the landscape of this country that we live in. It's okay to be immoral. And, uh, you know, this shows up in different ways. And in my world, it often shows up when somebody who's part of the church decides they want to get married. And so they come and talk to me, and they want me to do the ceremony, do it at church, all that kind of stuff. And one of the questions that we ask is, is, are you living with somebody outside the bounds of marriage? And, you know, I've heard every reason for it, believe me. Well, it's cheaper. Well, we're just, we're just trying to figure out and get to know each other better. I mean, all these things that come up. When any time that you're in a relationship with another person and it ends up being something that is sexual in nature, you are outside the will of God. And that's why it's it's a tough line to take, and I've gotten beaten senseless over the years about this, that if you come to me and you say, hey, we want to get married, I'm going to find out if you've been living together or not, and then we have to work through that whole thing. I've had several couples that quit living together right then that night, period. It was really great. But I've had others that say, you're judging me, and you're destroying me, and their parents get mad at me, and everybody gets mad at me, and all we're saying is you got to conduct your life in a moral way. And this is what it means to contend for the faith, and that's a challenge for all of us. When we talk about acceptance of immorality, we talk about couples living together before marriage, we talk about immorality in marriage, we talk about pornography, we talk about the cultural ex- Uh, acceptance of homosexuality, and the impact of the acceptance of abortion in this day and age, in the 21st century. And it's not surprising because these issues have always been at the crossroads of every culture that has tried to sustain itself over time. And somewhere along the line, the church has to stand for what is right and take your lumps for it. I've taken lots of lumps for it, but I have been able to lay my head on the pillow knowing that these are standards that we have to set and that we are going to contend earnestly for the faith. And we're getting involved in that more and more, even as a church. We're going to have a big event here at the middle of of January that's going to end up kind of touching on the abortion thing around right to life and that kind of thing. And you'll hear more of that. It'll be a great time for you to invite people that you know to come. It's a one-night deal. And in some ways, it is us contending earnestly for the faith. And that's important to do. Now, you don't need to be jerks about it, okay? And I think this is really important because so much of the message that we've tried to put out there to people gets kind of slobbered all over and gets kind of gummed up because people see narrow-minded, bigoted, hateful speech coming out of the hands of people who are called Christians. And you know what? Don't you dare do that. Don't undo all the work that God has done to try to get our culture to understanding there's something messed up by just being hateful or holding up signs or 
showing up at funerals and all that kind of stuff like the Westboro Church in Kansas has done for the years. And it's not right at all. We are contending earnestly for the faith. And it means all of these issues. When you think about homosexuality, you have to be reminded, we all do, that there's such a big question in our culture and such a level playing field right now between, yes, I can be homosexual and still love God, or I no, I can't, but I still love God. You know, all this stuff's going on in the minds of so many people in the church. Let me ask you to do this. You contend earnestly for the faith, and the way you do that is by knowing what the faith says about some of these things. Not me. I can give you great lessons on this, but I purposely don't do that. I just want you to know what the Word says about this. And if you're going to stand someplace, stand on the Bible, okay? Stand on the Word. And we're really, we're really seeing this change in our culture in 2019, 2020. The idea of the acceptance of homosexuality or the acceptance of just immorality in the church for our kids that are 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old and beyond, most of the kids now in our culture are saying, it's okay. And some of them want to pull out the grace card and say, I've got grace. I can figure this out. Immorality is never okay. Ever. Now, what we have to do is with people who are dealing with immoral situations in their life is is that we've got to take them on a journey so that they understand this is our faith. And because it's our faith, what we want to see happen is we want to see people attach themselves to the faith and contend earnestly for that faith. And it's got to be a lot more than just me being up here and you know saying a few things. So how do we contend earnestly for the faith? And uh, this is uh, the bottom part of your notes there. First of all, keep growing. Keep growing. Look what Jude says in verse 24, I believe it is. He said, or verse 20. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Building yourselves up in your most holy faith. If we don't get this, we won't get the rest of it, that's for sure. But the responsibility for the spiritual growth that you want to experience in your life or that you are experiencing in your life does not come from me. It comes from you hooking up with Jesus and growing in your faith that way. Build yourself up. We've become a culture now that a couple things are happening. One is, is that so many people come to church and they come to church and expect the preacher to spoon feed them what is true and what is not true and kind of help them grow in their faith. And I guess there's some okay with that. But listen, when you get right down to it, you're the one that's responsible for your spiritual growth. And it took me 25 years to understand that every time I stood on this stage, it was not my responsibility to make sure that you grow My responsibility was to point you to the word and let you grow in that word as you take it on and as you own it. You don't need me to spoon feed you at all. And that's why we do our sermons the way we do it and try to leave some open doors at the end for conversations and different things because you have to take responsibility to grow in your faith. The other thing that's happening in our culture today And again, I won't name any names, but we have so many superstar preachers who are taking the full advantage of the social media and the internet and all that. And all that's okay, okay? But those guys that are on the internet, they do not represent the final word about immorality. The Bible does. And what is interesting to see is, is how many people never dive into the Bible. And they just talk. You can see it this way, and this is what I struggle with, is this kind of uh, picture, well, not picture perfect, but it's a one-line sentence that often comes out from some of the preachers in, across our country, and that people just think it's so amazing that they can have so many of these pithy little statements you can put on Twitter or on Facebook and everything else. You know, if you're looking for statements about faith, right here. This is it. And you should not be so attached to uh, anything that's going to allow you to 
ignore the Bible at all. But the Bible is what we have to stay with. So how do we do that? Well, it's something you've heard me say a lot, and it's what I attach my life to, is you are responsible with digging your wells deep. You are. And, uh, and we say that over and over, and I'm going to keep saying it over and over. You want to go deeper in Christ, you're responsible to do that. Now, I can help point the direction and maybe even lead the way a little bit, but ultimately it's going to come down to you deciding that I want to grow in my faith, and I'm going to own that, whatever it is. And I've been preaching this idea of keep digging your wells deep for years, maybe 15 years, and I still have people that comment to me about how that phrase comes back to them, especially in critical moments when they know they've got to dig their wells deep so that they have something to draw from when times are going bad. See, you dig deep wells in the good times, but in the bad times, you know what you do? You draw from the well, and you draw, and you draw, and you draw. And then when things turn good again, you get back in there and you dig some more deep wells in your life. That's what it means to keep growing. So don't expect the church and don't expect the preacher or a class leader or even your spouse or your parents to do it for you. You are the one that can grow in your faith right where you're at. Here's the second thing. It's keep praying. And he says here in that verse, verse 20, and praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't think he's talking about a spiritual uh, prayer language that some some people talk about today. I think Jude is saying that relationships bore out growth when you have a relationship with God. And one of the ways that you can have a relationship with God is to pray. And you pray, and he talks, and you pray, and he talks and speaks things into your life. And all of a sudden, that, that conversation brings about a relationship. And that's what you need to be. And I think this is why so many of the things that we do in the church are important, like our Sunday school classes, We've got some small groups that are meeting, and we'll rev those back up after the first of the year. And some other classes on Wednesday night. You know, when you are relating to people who have similar situations in their life, then you can pray together and let God speak to you in your life. I have figured out that when I talk to God and listen to God, I grow. And uh, I'm strengthened, and I'm hopeful, and I feel strong as well. Strong enough to contend earnestly for the faith. And then the next thing is keep loving. Keep loving. He just says it right there in verse 21. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you into eternal life. There is a danger about contending earnestly for the faith. And it can be that you would be overcome by pride and by you know, really bad attitudes. And you don't want to be that way at all. You don't want to be overcome by legalism as well. And, you know, if you're talking to God and if you're praying and and in the word and everything, it it is, you're, you're prone, you really are prone to think that you're better than you are and better than everyone else who does not line up exactly with you. You become the purity police. And you become a jerk, too. Jude says, be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. How will you contend? How you contend will have a great influence on whether you're successful or not. The how, not just the what. The number one threat to the influence of the church of Jesus Christ is a lack of love. It's a lack of love. And everything that we attach ourselves to and want to see going, and even when we have to challenge somebody who's outside the will of God, it has to be done with love. Speaking the truth with love. That's what it's got to be. And so Jude gets this, I think, pretty well, and so should we. And then the last thing is this. We are to keep trusting. He says there in verse 24, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault or with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. 
Jude ends this letter with such a powerful word of encouragement. Contending earnestly for the faith is hard. It takes a lot of us to do that. But when we do it in love and then trusting that what we are doing is pleasing to God, even though it's bumpy and it's bruising it sometimes, and there will be sometimes that we'll want to ask the question, is it worth it to contend earnestly for the faith? And Jude says, yes, it is. It is. Not because of what we know, not because of our great church or our programs, but because of who we are contending for and what he is doing for us. And that's why you have these powerful words at the end of the chapter that are so good. Him who is able to keep you from stumbling, that's, that's Jesus. And to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. It is an effort, and it takes a lot of effort to contend earnestly for the faith, but this is what the book of Jude is all about. And so the days ahead for the church, and I think we're seeing this even in our own culture, the days ahead for the church are going to be tougher days. Tougher days. They're going to be hard. I mentioned earlier about abortion and what we're planning on putting together for January. That's going to be hard. And what we're going to need more than anything is prayer warriors, people who will go before God every day in front of this effort, which you'll hear more about later, and pray that we are contending earnestly for the faith. Because really, that's what we're doing. We're contending earnestly for the faith. And you do that by growing. You do that by praying. And you do that by loving. And you do that by trusting God. Why don't you stand with me, if you would. And let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you. God, we, we can't do this message without remembering that your grace overcomes all of this stuff that kind of comes out of us at times when we struggle. But I think even as a church here in the northern part, northwest part of Oklahoma City, we have opportunities to contend for the faith. We always want to do it with the right attitude and the right heart. We want to do it because we care for people. We want to do it because we love you. We want to do it because, God, you are so good. And I pray, Father, that you would constantly speak into our hearts and, and minds about what it really means to be a disciple of yours and to take what we can learn from Jude and apply it to our life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This week on Wednesday afternoon or evening, Christian songwriter and very famous singer by the name of Toby Mack had to go through a terrible experience where uh, his son died, 21-year-old son died. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, they're very public people and so forth, and so this is devastating in a lot of ways. But I love what he said in a little note that he put. He said, we don't have a deal with God where if he does good for us, we'll do good for him. What we've got is a love for him, no matter what happens in our life. And I thought, man, what a great testimony of even the most difficult of moments to say, we don't have an under-the-table deal with him at all. It's out in front. We love him. And I think that needs to be said of us, too, and the relationship that you have with Christ. This morning, we're going to close up, and as we do, uh, I'll be down front here and be glad to have any kind of conversations that you need to have, or we can have them during the week, whatever, and we'll do it, okay, and uh, help you in your walk with faith as well. Let's sing together.